Good morning, and welcome to Lesson 4 in our study of the Book of Romans. Today we're still in Chapter 1, and we're only going to cover two verses, verses 16 and 17. This is a short section, but some believe it is. these are the two most important verses in the Bible. And they have been the cause of some of the great shaking up done in the world in the past. Some compared them to the significance as that of the Magna Carta in England or the Declaration of Independence in the U.S. Wesley was imp impacted by this, these two verses when he read some of the literature of Martin Luther and he began the Wesleyan movement. Martin Luther himself was impacted by these two verses, especially the last part of verse 17. And he went on to write this, that I understood these words, the just shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith, and I felt born again like a new man. I entered through the open doors into the very paradise of God. I saw the beloved and holy scriptures with an other eyes, the words that I had previously detested I began from that hour to value and to love as the sweetest and most co consoling words in the Bible. In every truth, this text was to me the true gate of paradise. The, tr the just shall live by faith. Augustine himself was a dejected monk when he read these words and went on to become one of the greatest writers in Christian history, St. Augustine. So it has changed the world, these three, these two verses. It starts off by Paul saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And part of the problem with today is we often seem ashamed of what the true gospel is. We don't preach the true gospel anymore. The true gospel being the gospel of Christ is the fact that he was born, he died, he was buried and he was resurrected. This is the true gospel. And sometimes we don't cover that as much as we used to. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. Even though he was beaten, he was stoned, he was subjected to humiliation, he was run out of cities, he was jailed. He went through almost everything that people could go through and yet he continued to preach the gospel Christ. As he said in Corinthians, I preach Christ crucified. That was his gospel. And now, even before he came to the city of Rome, he was promoting this to the citizens of Rome, that great city, that great metropolis of that age. Over two million people, probably one of the biggest cities on earth at that time. But it was not a good city. It was not a good city at all. The, the Philosopher Seneca said that Rome was a cesspool of iniquity. The historian Gen Genevel said it was a filthy sewer into which the dregs of the empire flowed. I mean, it was not a nice city. And Paul was going to take this gospel to this area, this pagan-filled city of Rome, where the emperor lived, where the emperor's court was, and preach the gospel that Christ was crucified and rose again. He was not ashamed of this. People often are ashamed of the gospel because, there, because of four reasons. First of all, intellectual. It doesn't appeal to anybody who has a great education, who has a great deal of knowledge, or who thinks they know everything, who thinks they know a lot about the world because it is no true intellectual basis. And this is part of the reason why Paul was so persecuted in so many of the cities. It doesn't have a true intellectual basis like some of the other religions seem to have. And secondly, it had no philosophical basis. There was no deep philosophy behind this. There was no deep uh, arrangement or litany of gods. There was nothing to, to, to really support it from a philosophical point of view. In fact, there was nothing like it else on earth, there still isn't. This is the only religion where God sacrifices himself for us, instead of us having to sacrifice ourselves for the God. 
So from an intellectual and philosophical point of view, this the Christianity really did not have any real supporters. From a, from a social point of view, how can you be considerate to be socially social etiquette or to be socially acceptable when you're considering that you are that you are drinking the sacrificial uh, blood of blood and eating the sacrificial body of, of God. This is only symbolic of course because what Jesus was saying that his crucifixion was for us was was for us our entry into eternal life. So it was not socially acceptable. It was completely abhorrent to many people at the time. And for the same moral reason, how can you possibly honor someone, a criminal, who's been crucified by the Roman, Roman uh, process of crucifixion for criminals? The Bible once said that on any criminal hang, a criminal hangs upon a cross, and yet here is Jesus on the cross for us. So for reasons, there are many reasons why people would be ashamed, and still are ashamed, of the gospel. Intellectual, philosophical, social, moral. But the truth is that this is a very simple type of religion, a simple type of process by which God has reclaimed his relationship with us, and our relationship with him. And it's the only religion in which this type of symbolic, this type of rearrangement has been carried out. God has sacrificed himself to pay for our penalty. And it says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power to salvation. It is, it is not doesn't give you power, it is the power. It is the power which changed Martin Luther, it's the power which changed Wesley, the power which changed Augustine. The realization of the truth of the gospel has changed many, many lives. And it's a very simple realization because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, who has the faith. And this is really what it is, it's a belief. You have to accept what God has done for us in order to fully understand and realize and appreciate the sacrifice that was made. God himself came down in human flesh, sacrificed himself to pay for our sins, and we only have to accept it, believe it, and act on it. Faith in the spiritual sense really means believing what God has said and acting upon it. It came first to the Jewish nation, not because they were special, not because they were more in tune with God than anyone else, but God came first to the Jewish nation. Why? That's something he only himself knows. But it came first to the Jewish nation and then to the Greek, then to the Gentile, it's for everyone who believes. If you fully believe in the gospel, then it's the God power of God to lead you to salvation. Now, salvation is not just one-time thing. Salvation is refers to three different aspects. One, salvation frees you from the penalty of sin. We have all sinned. It is the gospel of God. It is not the gospel of men. Men have made all sorts of religious affirmations to try to reach the divine. And each one of these affirmations is not sufficient because whatever we do can never be enough to satisfy the holiness of God. If we think we are good, that's... that's and if we are good in our opinion, and in this opinion of society, that is nice. But it is far below the goodness that's required by God. So we have no play in this except to understand that God gave us as a gift eternal life through the belief, the recognition, the belief in, and the acting upon what Christ did 
on and after the cross. This is the gospel. And this is the gospel that Paul preached and of which he was not ashamed. The salvation is for the salvation deep frees us from the penalty of sin in the past. Whatever we did in the past, if we fully believe and accept it and then act on that belief, we are free from that penalty. We're also free from the power of sin in the presence. We can resist what sin wants us to do now. And we're also free from the presence of sin in the future. The power of sin is reported in Romans 6.23 the, pro, or the, present, the, the, or the penalty of sin is reported in Romans 6.23, the power of sin in Romans 6.14, and the presence of sin in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5. This is, what God, this is what Paul was preaching. This was the power of salvation that Paul was not ashamed of, and he went through many ordeals because of this, he had seen God 25 years or so before he was writing this letter. And it's his, his, his ardor, his enthusiasm, his belief had not changed. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. To anyone who believes, who has that belief, who really accepts the gospel, it is the power to salvation for the Jew first. It was a, given to the Jew first to the Greek next, or to the Gentile next, but to everyone now who believes. For it, in it is the righteousness of God, not man's righteousness. God did this as a gift and gave it to us as a gift. All we have to do is accept that gift, that payment for our sin. It is the righteousness of God it is not the righteousness of man. Nothing man has devised, nothing man can do, nothing man can develop is sufficient to satisfy God. And part of the reason is because it's not fair. Some people are able to do much more than others. Some people are handicapped, some people are mentally deficient, some people are physically inept. They can't do what others can do. Therefore, to put their righteousness, their abilities, what they do as part of righteousness would be unfair. This gift of God is available to everyone who believes. Back in the times of Abraham, Abraham believed God when God said to leave his country and go. When God said to take your son Isaac and sacrifice him, Abraham acted upon that even though God did stay the sacrifice. The fact that Abraham acted on it was sufficient to satisfy God's knowledge that Abraham believed God and as a result his faith was deemed to him as righteousness. This is exactly the same as it is now. Our faith is deemed to us as righteousness. This is the righteousness of God and revealed from faith to faith. It's revealed through time. It's revealed through the faith of people God himself doesn't necessarily talk to people individually, but he does talk to some, he does display himself to some, and those who have faith are supposed to impart that faith, hopefully to others, or to plant the seed of faith in others, so that they too will recognize the development and the truth of the gospel. Because, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those who are righteous those who have accepted Christ, those who have accepted the gospel, are supposed to live by faith. This is not a new concept. This was, this was, was mentioned back in the book of Habakkuk, back in, in chapter 2, verse 4, that the just shall live by faith. This is the theme of the entire Bible. And it was this verse which caused the transformation in Martin Luther, in Augustine, in Wesley and in many others. The fact that the people believed when the disciples who were, who were weak, who were uneducated, who were really doubtful, 
When Christ was crucified, they ran away. When Christ was arrested, they ran away. When they get, they gathered timidly in the upper room afterwards, wondering what to do. But when they actually realized that Christ was crucified and had resurrected, been resurrected from the dead, that he was alive again, they saw him, they touched him. And Thomas put his hands into his side and touched his hands. When this realized this, they became absolute dynamos. They became absolute dynamos for the, for the faith. They became the most most powerful adherents, the most powerful proponents that the world has ever seen. And those twelve fishermen and uneducated people for the whole part changed the world because they fully believed and acted upon the power of the gospel, the power of the risen Christ. This was the just living by faith. This is what changed Martin Luther. This is what changed Wesley. This is what changed Augustine. This simple phrase. And when they came to realize this, it opened up the gospel for them in an entirely new light. No longer was God an overbearing ogre who wanted punishment, who wanted, who wanted uh, complete physical servitude, who wanted sacrifices. Even in Isaiah, he said he was not Sad. He did not want the sacrifice of bulls and goats. He wanted obedience. And this is really what he's saying. If you have faith, and you do act upon that faith, and have the belief, what, belief in what God did for us, then you are living by the faith of your being. This is what this whole passage is about. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is, the, it is the power of salvation to those who believe. First to the Jew, then to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. God's ability, God's desire to reconcile with mankind and the way to proper reconciliation with mankind is revealed. God's righteousness is revealed from faith, dealing with faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. These are two of the most important verses in the Bible. And I hope I've been able to give them some, justif some justice in explaining the meaning of them to you. But that's sufficient for today. Hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll join me next week as we continue on in chapter 1 of the Book of Romans. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.